And we're live. Yay. Okay, so uh, everybody, thank you for joining myself and Paul on uh, the first of what we hope will be a few occasional informative dudes with a toot about our DNS talking about it. Um, I think Paul needs really no introduction. He is one of the great ones of the internet, uh, the creator of Bind and uh, the CEO and founder of Farsight. I've had the honor of working with him on a number of different projects over the years. And uh, I have the honor and, and the joy to be able to work with people that I've looked up to when I was uh, first getting involved in all this stuff. Well, thank you, Tom. And I do want to state for the record, I did not write Bind originally. That came from UC Berkeley. Uh, but I certainly took care of it from about 1989 onward. Um, and it's been a wild ride. Uh, so Tom is known to many of you, but I just want to say he has been working on the uh, same thing as me longer than we've known each other, which is how do you use DNS to secure other things? Right. There are a lot of people that are um, uh, trying to secure DNS. It's a little harder to secure the Internet uh, using the DNS as your security tool. So when Tom and I discovered that we were each working on this, we started working on it together. And that's been huge for me. So he is the CEO of ThreatStop, uh, which is a security company headquartered in San Diego. Um, so this is episode one. Uh, we did a teaser last week, turned out to be a bit of a sound check. Uh, but this is uh, the first of what we hope will be many sort of on topic, on target, uh, vital messages for the security community and the overall internet connected industry. Um, so we're not sure how often we'll do this. Uh, we'll do it when it's important. And we'll talk more about it, about that at the end. Uh, but today we want to talk about name rec, which is last week's headline by this time, but it has not yet been replaced. Our hair is still on fire for last week's reason. That's amazing. That's, uh, that's huge. We should capitalize on that somehow. Uh, but name rec was, uh, an important, I don't know, way post. Uh, let us know that we've still got a long way to go securing DNS itself, which of course, Tom and I also take a deep interest in. Um, and we want to talk about what can be done, not just what is the problem, but what can enterprises large and small do about it? Because uh, you have to protect yourself. That's the new world. Uh, government can protect you against uh, bombers from a neighboring country. They cannot protect you from cyber attacks from a neighboring country or indeed any country anywhere in the world. Uh, so I want to go to Tom so he can let you know kind of uh, what this is about. Thanks, Paul. So uh, NameRec was a disclosure done by Forescout Systems, and I'm using their actual PDF, which is a very well-written uh, workup, and I, I strongly recommend that you actually go get it and read it yourselves uh, to explain how this works. So it's a set of vulnerabilities that are, in many cases, unpatched, where the use of these together can result in an attack that can lead to either denial of service by crashing important devices or actually be used as a beachhead to compromise other devices within the network or the device itself. The, the way it works is you have devices that are in your network that are trying to query a name server that is outside your network. So you're using an external DNS server. And there are two ways that that can be used to attack you. The one is out of path, an attacker who has the ability to get packets to you faster than the name server that's being queried can pretend to be that name server, thanks to some of the vulnerabilities described, and send you maliciously crafted responses. Those maliciously crafted responses can be used to either cause the device to crash or in at least one theoretical case, uh, create the ability to run arbitrary code. Now, in the out of path situation, they have to be able to send, send stuff to the device and the device has to have one of the vulnerabilities that present, prevents it from actually validating that that packet's coming from where it says it is, the DNS server you're trying to query. But that is actually, unfortunately, still widely deployed despite the fact that post the Kaminsky cache poisoning attacks, people were supposed to be implementing this thing called TXID, but apparently there's still millions of devices out there that aren't. 
The other thing that they can do is they can compromise your DNS server. That DNS server, say, for example, in a hotel where you are relying on the DHCP server to provide you with a DNS server, can in fact itself be a malicious DNS server, in which case the TXID problem is is not a problem for the attacker because it will respond with the correct TXID, but can still maliciously send packets that can cause overflows to the querying device. That is uh, not a theoretical problem. In a large parts of the world, there is a botnet called Dark Hotel, which takes over the DNS that is in, handed out in the hotel and forwards it to known malicious DNS servers. So this is, at this point, well, I actually did a little test last night against an older version of a product that I sort of had been building and was was messing around with that used a older version of VXWorks, which is listed off as being one of the vulnerable items. And what I did was I crafted a packet that pretended to be from 8.8.8 .8 to send to this device, which I had querying a, a name at 8.8.8 .8 .8 that said, hey, go query this instead. And then I sent back a response for that C name that was zero length and the device stopped forwarding traffic. So it's not ready to, for Metasploit, at least what I did is not ready for Metasploit yet, but it's not theoretical in terms of being able to crash at least one of the enumerated vulnerable, admittedly older, but a lot of these devices that run these operating systems are almost never patched or replaced and maybe sitting in a closet or frankly, as a Novell server was once, behind drywall still doing what they do because they tend to be pretty reliable. They're small, they do little things. Um, so what types of devices are these? Well, uh, just on ThreadX, which is a embedded uh, stack that has this problem, there are billions of devices the world over. Mobile phones, your consumer electronics, some of your office automation tools, things like multifunction devices, faxes, et cetera, retail automation. So those are your smart, uh, they could be your POS systems or they could be your smart uh, vending machines. Um, one of the problems is that, uh, and it's again, the the, in the same industrial control systems that, uh, that have had other problems before, some of your industrial control systems. And then one of the things that I attacked, uh, which is an older uh, communication or networking device and conditions in aerospace controls. Uh, very unfortunate is it's also medical devices. One of the enumerated devices is a, uh, a drug pump. Uh, Johannes Ulrich and I demonstrated an attack against those at SANS five years ago. Apparently, it still hasn't been patched. Um, it's all over the world. Uh, these are that now the, the free BSD call out here is a little bit disingenuous in that it's only the DHCP client. So you'd have to have a malicious DHCP server to compromise a free BSD. But the other ones are actually uh, things that are running these known real time operating systems that have vulnerabilities. And which industries? Well, unfortunately, it's not, no one seems to be immune. Um, there are thousands of devices, and this is just from pulling on Shodan, and these are all in the report that are vulnerable. So it's, it's a real problem, and there's a good chance that if you don't have the vulnerability, someone you know does, and hopefully people will be able to mitigate it, but some of these devices aren't patchable. So how would you turn around and do that? And Paul and I have had a very long belief that the right answer to that is what Paul will describe. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think you also told me that uh, some cable modem systems are uh, set up so that you can see what your neighbor is sending and receiving, which would mean that any of your neighbors could see your question go up and uh, forge a very rapid response that would get there before the real response. Uh, so there's a lot of shared networks of that kind, not just cable modems. Yeah, exactly. If someone's network local, they can get the packet back to you faster than the remote DNS server. So I want to talk a little bit about how the DNS uh, has to work and then how it actually works and how it can work uh, and once did work. So there are three kinds of uh, DNS protocol agents in the world. And in other words, no matter what, uh, uh, if you're speaking the DNS protocol, you're, you are one of three things. You're either a stub, a client like a smartphone, laptop, virtual server, real server, whatever. You're making DNS questions to get your work done. Uh, or you are an authority server, which is where content enters the system. So VeriSign operates the .com servers. Those are authority servers. All of us have authority servers of some kind, even if we outsource that function. 
And then there's something in the middle between those two where the queries come from, uh, you can think of as the bottom and where the responses come from, you can think of as at the top. So in the middle, there's something called a recursive or uh, caching recursive, sometimes iterative, uh, sometimes full. There's a lot of names for it, but generally it's a recursive name server. That's what all of the 8.8 .8 servers and 1.1 and 9.9 and everybody who wants to, you to send them your DNS traffic is asking for you to program into your stub resolvers, your smartphones, your laptops, whatever, their address so that you will send your questions to them, which if they have an answer, they'll give it to you. If they don't, they'll go get it. And um, that, that thing in the middle, that recursive server, is where all of the important bugs in DNS have come from. Uh, it is where all the complexity is, and complexity breeds bugs. Um, so you might think we would pay a lot more attention to that than we do, um, but we're not. So it used to be back in the 80s when it was all research and the 90s when it was a mix of research and early commercial use, uh, everybody had to run their own name server because maybe their ISP had one for them, maybe they didn't. And so we all just got used to having a recursive server inside our network perimeter on our side of a firewall. Um, and that was great because there weren't the vulnerabilities then that there are now, but had there been a vulnerability, it would have to be in the code you were running, not in code somebody else could be running outside your network because your traffic wasn't going outside your network. That's very important. Um, Anyway, in the aughts, everybody was trying to figure out how to make money fast on the internet. And so we got a lot of uh, people saying, oh, I, I'm, I wanna run your DNS for you. Just send your traffic to me, trust me. Um, but of course, there's always some motive for them to do that, which is that they wanna know what you're doing or they wanna know what is the statistics of the upstream. They wanna know which content servers, the authority servers are visited most recently. They want analytics, they, whatever it is they're doing. Uh, so the, I guarantee that no commercial entity has ever gone into business with a plan approved by shareholders that said, we just want to give away free services and we're not going to get anything from it. Um, but anyway, that is uh, where we are now is that uh, most people now using the internet don't remember a time when we all had to run our own recursive servers. And so they think that there's no choice. They think you have to use 8.8 .8 or 9.9 or 1.1 or OpenDNS or whatever. And indeed, there are some great companies uh, that are providing that service. Um, but there are also some, you know, fly-by-nighters, uh, smaller entities. Everybody's competing for this traffic. And uh, so we've got this whole generation who doesn't know you don't need to talk to any of them. Um, so I want to say there's a couple of ways you can, you can do this. Uh, you know, avoid the risks Tom was talking about by running your own local recursive name server. Um, so there are products. First and foremost, you could buy something from the Efficient IP, Blue Cat, Infoblox, probably a dozen others that I'm giving short shrift to because I just didn't think of them at the top of my head. There are a lot of companies who make very good appliances that can do this for you. So if you need a commercial product that'll just sit inside your network and perform this vital function, in a trusted manner, that's that's out there. If you want to do it yourself, obviously that's what I do, what Tom does, then you're probably going to have a whole lot of Linux and BSD machines inside your perimeter, and you can just add one more virtual machine somewhere and install Bind or Knot or Unbound or some open source name server. And then you're, again, it's you're keeping it all inside your perimeter using a supply chain that you at least theoretically could verify. Um, there's a, com a company out there making something called the Pi Hole. This is an itty bitty Raspberry Pi that's got a prefabricated Linux image that's got a name server in it. And so if you don't want to do it yourself, but you can't afford a big commercial product, there are tiny commercial products for you know a small number of dollars who can solve this problem. Windows comes with this, at least Windows Server comes with this. Virtually all Linux machines and BSD machines have the ability to install a pre-compiled name server. So what I'm trying to say is it's, a, it's an option-rich environment. There are not a lot of constraints on you as to how you keep your DNS traffic local. I just recommend that you do so. 
Uh, we may have to come back in a few weeks based on the comments because I expect some people are going to talk about the privacy problems of running your own recursive name server. That's a that's sort of a big uh, big item for some people right now, and we'd love to address that, but not today. Um, but uh, we also have Tom, who again has been trying to secure other things using DNS as long as I have, and he's actually got a product which uh, he wants to tell you about, which makes it very easy to do this on your laptop. So if you're a road warrior, if you are ever allowed back on airplanes, you might want to have a recursive name server as a virtual machine on your Windows laptop. Uh, or there's a lot of different other ways that you could use Tom's, uh, Tom's system. But I wanted to give Tom a chance to uh, sort of describe and demonstrate that. Thanks, Paul. Um, obviously, you know, I started what I'm doing to solve a problem I had. And one of the problems I have as I travel around the world uh, on business is that I, uh, I go to these hotels and I can't trust what is being sent to me from those name servers, especially if I'm in Asia. Um, and, and so, well, what was the problem I was, I was dealing with? I needed to still have DNS that worked. If it gave me a response that wasn't correct, I wanted to know that. I also wanted to filter what was coming in and where I was going to meet my needs. Uh, so we had started, we had built already a tool that worked with many of the, the options that Paul mentioned earlier, but we didn't have the ability to easily use that when we weren't on the network. So with the encouragement of Paul Macapetris, who works for us, uh, we built our own version of Bind. Uh, it's actually Bind stripped down to respond only locally. That's easy to install and manage so that you can have this trusted recursor on your own laptop that manages that. And you can assign a policy to it. We have those policies. I can show really quickly, I guess, how you build one. You can choose if you want to then tell it, uh, when I'm on my home network, I have these DNS servers. I don't want to be running this product. I'll use my home network. Um, you can also say, hey, do I want to use uh, the stuff I get from DHCP? So I'm just applying my policy. Or do I want to send it to 8.8.8 .8 or 9.9.9 .9 if, if I don't have the resolution locally? Now, obviously, that doesn't solve the problem of someone spoofing 8.8.8.8. .8 All these wonderful services that are out there unsurprisingly, if someone is malicious, they'll try to be pretend to be that. And then also pretty importantly is enforcing DNSSEC, which ensures that the response is actually properly signed. And if you're getting an authoritative response, which if you're running a recursor mode, you will be, if you're not cached, uh, it is actually coming from who said it was coming from as opposed to somebody pretending to be somebody else. Installing it's actually pretty simple. This is the actual configuration. You give it a name, you pick a policy. I've got a few different policies I built. They're basic ones built. Okay, you don't have to do it yourself if you don't want to. I have an ad blocker that I'm using and what you want to do with it. And then it just goes forward and you get the documentation. The documentation for how to do this is publicly available on our site at docs.threatstop.com. So you can preview it um, and you have the ability to do that. When you're doing it, if you don't have a policy or you want to just use, you know, if you don't want to use one of our pre-built policies, like I didn't, I wanted to add ad blockers to it. You have the ability to pull up and make a policy of your own. So I block a whole bunch of ad blockers just to save myself time and energy. And so I created this policy right here, which is what's running on my red laptop. Uh, it's just going to load for a second. It's a pretty big policy, so it takes a second for the JSON to load. But you see, I'm blo I'm, I've decided that I want to um, block the malware domain list. I don't want to allow DNS tunneling, which is used to ex exfiltrate data by botnets, etc. I want to make sure that I know if I'm connecting to a honeypot. There's a whole bunch of different things I decided to put in the policy. And you have the ability to do that. Or you can just pick one of our pre-built ones. Um, we make it easy for you, OK? Um, and then when you're all said and done, it's running, you can see what you went to. This is the laptop that's actually running that. And I want to show you that really quickly. There it is. This is what it looks like in operation. It's a small little widget, uh, usually minimized. 
and you can see how many things I block. Now remember, I'm doing ad blocking on this. So if you look, you'll see I have all of the different uh, things. That it's really interesting to see the call homes that go on. You'll notice that my computer is running just fine, even though I'm blocking all of these things that are telling people upstream what's going on. You have the ability to tell what you're doing and you can turn it on or off very easily. So bad.threatstop.com is a place that you go to test. Garden is where we send fish. So you get people can be warned about fish, but if you want to stop going to the bad place, it's blocked. And that's pretty much how it works. And then you can come back and you get the ability to look at what exactly you connected to. Um, just set the filter for seven days. There we go. Here are some of the things I went to. Okay, you can get more data on it. I deliberately went to some bad places. So a um, lot of drill down information that analysts would like to have. And uh, you can hey, Tom, get the matches. I'm, I'm still seeing this site can't be reached, but we're also down to our last eight minutes. Okay, sorry. I'll switch back to the uh, other share. Um, yeah, you're right, sorry. So here's just some data of you know how the how the bad works and what's done with it. So uh, the the answer here, and this uses a technology that was developed by uh, by Paul and uh, Vern Shriver. Um, Vern and Paul built it. It was originally in Bind. It's now in most publicly uh, sold name servers, and it's called Response Policy Zones. And uh, Paul should tell you how and why he did it. Cool. Thank you, Tom. Um... I love my command line stuff and text files and so forth. So I'm probably not a candidate for your, uh, my DNS system, uh, but I know people that really should have it. And I'm going to be, um, sitting with them as before and uh, getting it installed. And cause you don't have to know much. You don't have to know much of anything really to, to get this running for you. Maybe CISOs ought to set this up on laptops that people take with them to trade shows. Um, anyway, so, um, in my contribution to uh, trying to use DNS to secure other things, we care about two things. First, monitoring it, knowing what's going on. And second, filtering it, being able to stop things. We want bad people to get terrible, terrible quality of service for their DNS content. Um, and that's a problem uh, because the uh, you know, DNS right now works pretty darn well and it's complicated. It fails a lot, but mostly it works uh, for everybody. And so, we created two, two things. Uh, one was DNS tap, uh, created at Farsight by uh, some Robert Edmonds who has since left us, but uh, DNS tap lives on. And that just lets the local infrastructure get a telemetry feed of whatever kind of data they want to get out of that recursive server. So you get a chance to see kind of what your local population is up to. Now you could use that for surveillance, but we do not. Uh, we only collect server to server traffic. We don't, we never see an end user IP address because I am very much anti surveillance. Um, but you know, if you're an enterprise, you might want to know what your, uh, C suite is clicking on because they might get a phishing attack that they believe It'd be nice to know. Um, whereas if they switch over to DNS over HTTP, they're going to bypass all of that. So, uh, that's yet another set of reasons to keep your recursive name service local if you can. Uh, but with RPZ, we came up with a way to filter so that you can uh, just uh, subscribe to a security provider of your choice and to say, look, my recursive server uh, needs some help. It needs some uh, shields, some swords, some guns, some knives. Uh, where do I get those? Well, I don't know. But uh, let's say Tom, for example, is an expert at that kind of thing. Let's just follow his advice. And his advice might change every second of the day if he's got a lot of complex complex machinery watching the the, the world and uh, deciding what should maybe not get correct dns resolution and that's what the rpz system does and um as tom said it started out as a bind nine thing but it's now in cannot and unbound uh, of course since bind is in infoblox and blue cat then they get it the efficient uh efficient ip people have it uh, so there's a big security uh, audience of people who have name servers that can benefit, that can subscribe. We have a bunch of providers, uh, and we're trying to sort of put the best uh, best data into the hands of anybody who can benefit from it. So we're down to our last five minutes. We're gonna we're gonna have to really breeze through this. 
So Tom, take us through Nod. So one of the things that Paul and I have been working on is how do you, how do you find what's new? Um, that is a lot of work. Uh, Paul and the guys at Farsight came up with the idea that if something is newly observed, if a, a, a domain name hasn't been seen before, you probably don't really want to go there very quickly. So taking that data and applying it into a response policy zone is a very effective way of blocking fish, new malware downloads, etc. A typical real domain is going to take some time to set up the infrastructure on, and they're going to usually run some tests. So it'll be observed before it's really live. There are some exceptions, but usually the, if something's new, there's really no good reason to go there, or at least you might want to look into what you can do. By the way, the thing about response policy zone, it doesn't necessarily say you have to block. It allows you to redirect. It allows you to simply pass through and log. You can look at what's going on. And so what we use newly observed domains as sent by Farsight for our users to do is to enable them to either redirect for deeper inspection or block or simply alert on people going to something new. It can also be used as a really good phishing training tool by redirecting to a site that says, hey, you know, I don't want to be uh, going there or I want to see what's, what's there already. So it's very, very useful. And uh, we have found in the incident responses that we've been doing over the last few, uh, few weeks and months to the SolarWinds attack, the exchange attack, et cetera, that a lot of these newly discovered attacks use domain names that were observed by, newly, by Nod before anybody actually knew that there was something bad going on about them. And so if people have been monitoring or alerting or blocking, they would have figured out that something was going on in their network that they didn't want to have. And as a result, would have protected against it. Yes, indeed. Uh, this, this technique sounds too simple to work, but it really does work. It also uh, actually rejects a fair amount of spam spam tends to use uh, newly minted domain names and if those don't work your mail server is going to reject the mail so it's amazing that something this simple that has got no magic no uh, no blockchain whatever uh, it, it can be so effective at this late date so we're down to our last uh, three minutes here and i want to say what you can do about it is uh, of course visit the website tom has put on the screen um, We'd love to have people sign up for uh, just kind of uh, information feed, right? So the feed, RPZ as a technology is completely open, completely open source. There's no patent, no royalty, no licensing. It's everywhere. Um, when you want content for it, then there are companies out there that'll sell you a subscription. Uh, Farsight and ThreatStop both do that, but there were among many other companies who do so. So... Uh, the call to action here is number one, first and foremost, run your own name server, put it inside your perimeter, stop talking to these uh, sort of the, the, the sweet sirens of, uh, yes, to outsource it to us and we'll take care of it for you. Turns out you can outsource it to yourself and have no more work than you have now, but have a lot more safety. Then once you've done that, start thinking about what else you might want to do, like filtering, like monitoring. Um, so if you visit the uh, far, excuse me threadstop.com website um, and on the blog uh, post that got you here um, is going to have a bunch of links uh, to follow up materials. Uh, there's a corresponding blog post over on the Farsight website, uh, which will also be updated. And um, we really, again, this is meant mostly as a PSA, public service announcement. We want you to run your own name server. Uh, we do not make more money if you do so. You are safer, and we want to create a world that is safer for our children to grow up in. And that's why we started the companies that we started, and that's why we work so hard on the products that we've described. But you don't have to buy anything to simply stand with us and make a better, safer world by uh, installing some name service technology inside your perimeter uh, so that all of your devices that are like of uncertain age, uh, not even their makers, if they're still in business, know what DNS stack they have in them. So you, you're never going to secure your endpoints, but you could secure the services they're talking to. So um, I think we're not going to have time for questions, but Tom, 30 seconds or less. Uh, when are we going to do this next? Well, I, I guess we live in interesting times, right? So, uh, we want to be people to be safe. We want them to be 
uh, able to have privacy and control over their own information. Um, there seem to be an ever increasing cadence of these things. It seems to be about every four to 10 weeks, something new comes out. We're not going to be just spewing you with, uh, with calls to action when there isn't anything new, but as we find new things and we have ways to, to help you interdict them, we're going to want to offer it to you. Uh, the page I'm showing is our signup page. Uh, the numbers on the right here are actually live from customer log data. We only get logs on what was actually blocked. Um, you can use our, our MyDNS client without using our service. Uh, it's, a, as I said, just a locally controlled bind. And uh, as part of our quid pro quo for using bind, we do provide it in such a way that it doesn't have to be used with the service. Or you'd like you to use the service, we have a community version that uh, is free as long as you upload your logs, which we use to detect false positives or new attacks. Um, and, uh, and obviously, we would like you to use the commercial service so we can make a living, but you don't have to. Um, so I think, uh, thank you very much for your time and look forward to informing. If we didn't inform, I hope we entertained at least a little bit. Indeed, I second, second that emotion. So uh, let me thank all of you for showing up and uh, wherever you found this, uh, you'll see in the future, uh, the next time we wanna talk about something that we think is highly relevant. So uh, time is the one thing we can't get back. Thank you for sharing yours with us today. And that's our show.